at, uh, we've gotten the, the thumbs up um, from our presentation team. I want to officially thank all of you for being here. I want to welcome all of you for um, the first um, diversity lecture series presentation for 2023. Um, I am... Uh, um, honored to serve as co-chair of the uh, Ed Studies Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee with Kristen Mills. Uh, Dr. Mills is currently in another meeting. She'll join us as soon as she can. But in the meantime, I'm going to get us going. So in honor of uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Day of Service, which is Monday, um, we wanted to bring a, a presentation to all of you today that would give us all the opportunity to think about how is another unit on campus um, working through the steps that we would like to work through in order to increase the diversity, equity, and inclusion in our department. Um, and so we invited um, Dr. Melissa Ross, Dr. Gaby Hicks, and uh, Dr. David Julian to present on uh, their experience, their their ready, the the racial equity, diversity, and inclusion ready R E D I movement, a formal intervention to address racism. Um, I'd like to just briefly introduce our presenters. Uh, Dr. Melissa Ross is serves as the associate director of research partnerships and impacts. Um, she's also a project director for the um, center's equity engagement and evaluation work. Um, she works to establish and cultivate research partnerships, manage the center's um, research um, programs, and then support everyone's work relative to engagement um, in research scholarship and instruction. Uh, Dr. Gaby Hicks uh, is one of our own alum. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. She um, has a longtime passion and has been working for many years in the pursuit of equity, social justice, and systemic change, um, which led her to do her PhD in ed studies in school psychology. And finally, Dr. David Julian um, is the program director of equity engagement and evaluation. Um, that um, is also uh, Dr. Ross is the co-director. Um, and Dr. Julian, <clears throat> excuse me, has a variety of experiences and participation in professional roles that allow him to be an active strategic planner, evaluator, and community engagement consultant. And so the when we heard about the wonderful project uh, Ready and, and how, um, how systematic and inclusive that process is, we wanted to share it with everyone in Ed Studies. So uh, welcome to um, uh, our three presenters. And um, so thank you and it's now all yours. Thank you, Colette. I will get us started. Uh, I am so happy to be here. I uh, want to start by acknowledging uh, our director who is at Studies own, uh, Dr. Anna Paula Correa. Uh, she is here with us and we're excited um, about uh, her leadership in this project. Also wanna give a special acknowledgement to Dr. Belinda Gimbert, who I understand uh, recommended us for this presentation and is also a really critical member of not only the C community, but also our Ready community. And so we're excited that uh, the two of them, as well as many members of our steering team and uh, those participating in our movement are here with us today. And so with that, uh, we'll get started and I wanna start by saying that we're really honored by the opportunity to share our work and our experience, our lessons learned with you all to uh, contribute to your efforts to uh, continue to enhance your social justice practice. Want to start by um, just talking a bit about our center. Not all of you may be familiar with our center, which is the Center on Education and Training for Employment. We are in uh, at a Translational Research Center out of the College of Education and Human Ecology. Uh, for us, what translational research means is, uh, as our tagline describes on this slide, where research meets reality. Uh, every single day we find ourselves at the intersection of where research meets reality in partnership with uh, those in communities who are serving uh, children, families, employees, employers, and really working with them every single day to advance um, the workforce throughout uh, the state, the nation, the globe, uh, as well as the health of communities. We particularly focus in the areas of education, workforce, community development, 
That includes family engagement work and efforts. That includes assessment. Um, I know one of our assessment folks are on the, on the meeting today. And so we're excited about the opportunity to uh, talk with you about how we got started in this work and, and uh, give you a bit of a sense of our journey. Um, in May of 2020, like most organizations, we uh, experienced the quote unquote racial awakening um, and really uh, jumped on that as an opportunity to pull the veil back, so to speak, relative to the role of race in our day-to-day -day practice, the role of race relative to achievement of the mission that you see in front of you. And we acknowledged that we were falling short. And um, because of the passion and the energies that were created by that, we were able to kind of take another look at our mission and um, ensure that equity was infused in our work such that we can truly achieve the mission that you see before you, which clearly cannot be achieved without uh, due attention to equity. So with that as a backdrop, I wanna present the objectives for our presentation today. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Hicks will talk us through uh, the frame that we use to design our ready work uh, through the social justice principles and really that commitment to uh, uh, addressing systemic racism. Uh, Dr. Julian, who hopefully will be able to jump on board before we finish, will present a bit about how we are um, integrating our translational research tools and practice in our effort to pursue racial justice. And then I will uh, share some of the pieces and parts of our movement, give you a sense of what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to Gabrielle. All right, hello everyone. Um, I try to start with the caveat that this ready movement um, was already in place before I joined in and it was a fantastic thing to come into and know that um, I'm a part of a department and a place of work who values this. Um, so it was exciting work to get into. Um, and so part of what I did was really looking at the components of how ready was developed and looking at the literature around social justice um, and the what the literature says is uh, what really really social justice is, uh, what are the primary components and um, overarching themes, and then looking at the work that we're doing to make sure uh, that we're really fulfilling that mission of social justice. Um, and so that literature review um, and work really brought up four overarching themes is how um, I divide them. And so the principle of human rights really acknowledges um, that a fair and just society really validates, protects, defends the basic rights that are inherent to all people and should be granted without discrimination. Um, so this principle al also requires that a government is really held accountable when these rights are violated. Um, when we talk about the principle of access, we're talking about uh, the provision of critical services and resources. So you can think food, shelter, healthcare, education to all people, regardless of socioeconomic status, uh, race, gender, sexuality, sexuality um, and other social identity groups. Uh, the principle of access also really identifies this cycle of marginalization that occurs when certain groups are restricted from accessing certain resources, some of those ones that I shared, um, and even good schools, proper health care. Um, it also acknowledges that this cycle of marginalization has to be disrupted. We have to acknowledge what exists, the cycle that's causing the problem, and that that must be intentionally disrupted um, through equi uh, providing equitable access to these resources uh, that directly influence one's quality of life. Um, and each of the principles of social justice are really underscored by this theme of equity. You'll hear us use that word. Um, and I think overall, that is our mission behind READY. And so equity acknowledges the reality of diversity, um, such that different people have different needs and require different resources that are responsive to those needs. So there's a common um, image that you may have seen of um, a person standing on boxes and each one has the same size box. They're trying to see over a fence, um, but there are different heights. And so, you know, the box helps one person to see over the fence, but the other two, because of their height, the box isn't helping them to see over the fence. And so um, equity really talks about different size boxes for the needs of those particular people so that everyone can see over the fence. Um, this principle really supersedes a one-size-fits-all approach, so similar to what I just described, one-size-fits-all uh, approach isn't uh, really equity, and so um, 
that one size fits all really um, negates the lens of equity and what we're trying to do with making sure everyone has what they need. Um, finally, the principle of participation refers to the inclusion of all voices in decision making and really prioritizing the voices of those who are directly um, impacted by these issues. So with this lived experience of marginalization. Um, the principle highlights the interconnectedness of each of these core principles um, of social justice and particularly that access and equity piece. Um, for participation to occur, those in positions of power must remove barriers to participation, and that um, results in increased access and making intentional space for the equitable inclusion of multiple voices and diverse perspectives, particularly of those um, of marginalized groups. So when we talk about this um, and what this means for our work, um, we tried to, again, ground that in research. And so social justice education pedagogy, um, or SJE, um, is really what I saw in the literature regarding um, how researchers in the field of education are really trying to make social justice applicable um, to the learning experience. So if we're trying to communicate social justice to people and why it should matter and how this impacts their work, um, it really refers to the social justice education pedagogy. Um, so this offers effective approaches for actively engaging learners in the process of acquiring and applying the knowledge of social justice and related topic areas. Um, it emphasizes the, the need for congruency between what's learned and how it's learned. Um, so it's not just about the content, but what are our approaches and our strategies to um, learn that new content? How are we presenting it? How are we interacting and activating that new knowledge? Um, also along these lines is uh, theory, critical social theory, um, and that really indicates that there's a connection between identity, knowledge, and power, so the sense of who we are and what we know about ourselves in the world really shapes what we can do with ourselves and with others. Um, so again, talking about how this is, you'll notice as we talk about ready and how we set it up in the framework, it's multidimensional. It's not, you know, just one PD or, you know, one conversation, one lecture, um, but it's multimodal, um, a variety of different uh, goals and really activates learning in a variety of different ways for the learner. Um, so among this process, um, another term to know is cognitive dissonance, and this is a critical component of new learning, actually, I, I saw in the literature, and that this tension between our previously held beliefs and our newly acquired knowledge is actually what uh, pushes us forward in the conversation of social justice. That's where the learning occurs, right, when we're able to challenge um, some of those things uh, that we previously held as, as strong beliefs. As we're getting this new knowledge, we're wrestling between the two. That's actually where the work occurs. Um, and again, with social justice education pedagogy, um, we're really emphasizing the role of social justice educators as well. Um, so these are individuals with a responsibility to really affirm these principles of social justice in their environments, um, model socially just behavior and decision making, and then co-construct socially just environments. Um, and this is a model for this greater world vision. So again, you'll see that as well as we talk about ready uh, framework later on about how it starts with the interpersonal and then it's those interpersonal conversations that lead to then policy change and how we are um, adapting our work environments, and then ultimately how that affects our sponsors um, and our reach across uh, the globe beyond our organizations. All right, so I'm going to jump in here. Uh, Dr. Julian is continuing to have technical difficulties. The link somehow is not working for him. So I am going to attempt to present his slides. I'm going to acknowledge for you all right now that I will not do them justice. Uh, but I'll give you a flavor. Uh, so here again, you see our tagline where research meets reality. We approach this task as we do every task as a translational research center and really thought about leveraging um, community uh, practice tools and translational research tools for the purpose of designing our movement, executing it, and then improving, improving it along the way. Uh, so we consult, started with consulting the research to really understand what the research tells us about uh, the scope of this. We decided early on that we really wanted to attend to this idea of uh, the intrapersonal and interpersonal uh, levels of the work. Our belief is that uh, although 
Some may deem it not necessary. I know that there are many folks that decide that they don't have the time to kind of really dig into that, that level of the work. We see it as an accelerant to the work. And so really wanted to consult the literature in that regard and really understand um, those pieces and parts so that we could ensure that that was incorporated into the movement as we designed it. And we also based it on our process, on our translational research process for designing and executing an intervention. And so we used our solution generation process, uh, worked through implementation in partnership with our steering team. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about the role that they serve later and are actively now um, really digging into evaluation. Um, this is a, a passion product uh, uh, supported through sweat equity. Um, we were able to put a little bit of funding behind it, but primarily uh, we are doing this outside of our funded project work. And so what that means is there are things like evaluation that we did not do early on that we are really now able to dig into and are really working to design and have designed what we believe to be a rigorous evaluation uh, that we're in the process of initiating. And then finally, wanted to talk a bit about some of what we see as the innovations of our approach. The first is this idea of centering community voice. Uh, we understand that it's one thing to talk about amplifying community voice. It's one thing to talk about giving community a seat at the table. It's a whole nother thing to talk about giving community influence over the work that you do, positioning community to make decisions relative to guide the work that we do. And we're really working to have really worked to, I should say, operationalize that concept of centering community voice and are using that both internally, and you'll hear a bit about that as I talk through the components, as well as externally operationalizing that in a way where our external partners can position those uh, in marginal, those who um, have been identified in marginalized populations to influence and impact and drive uh, decisions that are made and, and uh, needs as they're being identified and so on and so forth. So we used our problem solving process and ongoing engage in evaluation and quality assurance planning so that we can fine tune as we learn and we grow and expect to learn much, much more as we jump into more rigorous evaluation. So wanted to just give you um, more of a detailed sense of what the movement actually looks like, um, how we talk about it on a day-to-day -day basis and implement it. We started, um, as folks typically do, by establishing uh, our vision for the work. And uh, it is grounded in uh, what Dr. Hicks talked about relative to dealing with those four levels. So intrapersonal, understanding that we've got individual work to do, uh, interpersonal, related to the way that we interact with our colleagues, our friends, our family members, our partners, uh, institutional work related to our center and how we are practicing the policies that we are operating within as a center, and then societal. Uh, as you think back to our mission, we have you know, a pretty large uh, scope relative to our spheres of influence. We're working with state agencies every single day. We are working with employers across the globe. We are working with teachers and district administrators. And so clearly we have a sphere of it that we can influence if we position ourselves to be effective change agents. And so with all of that in mind, we established the vision that you see in front of you and are really intentional about uh, ensuring that the spaces that we create, the spaces that we inhabit and have influence over uh, are inclusive, safe and welcoming, really uh, honing in and being attentive to belongingness and ensuring that we acknowledge privilege, uh, we don't shy away from that, and we mitigate uh, the negative aspects of privilege, but then are intentional about ensuring that we are using the privilege that we have to uh, be uh, meaningful and effective agents relative to the pursuit of racial justice. So the three goals that you see in front of you are the goals that really um, um, serve as the umbrella for the work that we do and what we strive for each and every day. Uh, the first is around this idea of uh, building our knowledge and skills re relative to the posture and practice of cultural humility. That is really how we spent the first two years, and we continue to engage in that work. As I mentioned earlier, our belief is we got to get our own individual houses in order first, have to understand our own biases, have to understand how we are engaging with and um, contributing to this system as individuals that uh, promotes or um, 
does not promote, I'll, I'll say it that way, the equity that we strive for so that we can ensure that we are continuing to grow as individuals. And then also engaging in that interpersonal work to, to practice with our colleagues, to continue to engage and discover and explore with our colleagues. Uh, the second goal is really focused on um, identifying and establishing anti-racist norms, practices, and policies at sea. We've really started to dig into that very intentionally um, over the last several months. We could have done that early on, but again, really wanted to focus on ensuring that when we begin to do that work, we have a more fine-tuned equity lens as individuals, so to speak, because it's one thing to have a conversation with folks that don't really get it. And I know that you all know what I mean when I say that. It's a whole nother thing to have the conversation with folks who are digging into it and who are exploring things both for themselves as well as expanding their knowledge relative to the concepts and the issues that impact this work every single day. And so as we uh, made progress with goal number one, we're now really digging into goal number two and doing some work with our senior leadership team, uh, particularly focused in the area of inclusive hiring practices, because that's where we believe it starts getting the diversity and, and a sense of belongingness within our organization so that we all can work together uh, towards that third goal, which is really the big prize, contributing to the dismantling of, of institutional racism within our spheres of influence. For me, it's overwhelming to think about the, the big grand globe and kind of all of the issues that need to be corrected. So we think about just our little corner of the world, what we have influence over, and really doing our best every single day to be intentional about trying to have an impact where we can within our sphere of influence. And so we talk a lot about thinking both about the head and the heart work. Um, as painful as that racial, quote unquote, I like to call it the quote unquote racial awakening was, and um, as painful as the pandemic was, one of the things, or is, I should probably say, one of the things that it has done for us is to make it more acceptable to unapologetically present with our humanity at work in the same that, way that we do outside of work and to be transparent about our experiences and how they differ. And so we have really leaned into that. Uh, Dave and I have worked together for 20 years now, and we have talked about race more in the last two years than we did in the 18 years before that. And I always laugh at Dave because, you know, we had a conversation about Black. And do you say, I, I am um, thinking about how this affects the Black community and just how difficult use of that word can be when you're not comfortable operating in this space. But now we throw around those kind of words every single day because we are comfortable having the uncomfortable conversations. And so that really is what this um, reference to the heart work is. Uh, we've established what we call rules of engagement to create the safe spaces that are required to have these conversations. It's one thing to talk about race at home uh, outside in the community, which is difficult enough, it's a whole nother thing to bring those conversations into the professional environment. And so we have created rules of engagement that we believe serve as a foundation for creating that safe space. Our very first rule of engagement focuses on the fact that uh, racism is a thing. We're not going to debate that. If that is something you want to debate, you as an American have that right. But do that over there, and then when you're ready to engage in the work, we'll be here and we'll welcome you with open arms. Um, and another two of our other rules of engagement are to both give um, constructive feedback with grace and to accept constructive feedback with grace. As a Black woman, um, I have received feedback with grace over the last two years and, in, and, and am uncovering my own realizations relative to how I have been steeped in bias and anti-Blackness and how that is showing up in ways that I didn't necessarily realize. And I have also had the privilege of giving to my colleagues, my white colleagues and other colleagues of color, uh, feedback related to that because our lenses are growing. Um, and so we can see things in ourselves and in each other that we haven't historically seen and are working to create an environment where it is okay to say that out loud, to talk that through, uh, to interrogate that, um, to have discourse around that in a way that is constructive. And again, I just want to highlight 
are thinking that the intra and interpersonal work is not necessarily required, quote unquote, but we deem it to be an accelerant to the work that you can, if you do that work and really understand your own stuff and are working to improve your own stuff and have educated yourself that you're really, we are really able to come to the table as more effective change agents each and every single day, which then positions us to engage in the real work that is the institutional and societal change. And so this is um, just kind of a quick snapshot of what READY actually is. And so we'll just quickly walk through those components. The first, if you look in the white box here, is commitment, to le commitment of leadership. Uh, very early on, our leadership said, this is an issue that we're going to tackle head on and we are going to hold ourselves accountable. Now, we're not an iron, iron fist accountability uh, type of shop. Anybody that knows Anna Paula knows uh, that that's not the way we operate. But we are um, using transparency and using um, identification of outcomes and expectations as a means of holding ourselves accountable and committing to a course of action. As I mentioned, we established a steering team very early on. Our steering team started with about 14 folks that came to the table and said, uh, I want to do something. This is unacceptable. I realize I'm a part of it and I want to engage, I have no idea what to do, uh, but I want to come together with some folks and figure that out. And so in July of 2020, we all came together, scheduled an hour and a half meeting, but spent two and a half hours telling our individual stories, talking about our histories and the lens through which we understand and experience race, uh, talking about our passions and our commitments in this space. And then really agreeing that we're going to work together to kind of figure this out, both in terms of how we as individuals can enhance our practice, and then eventually how we can impact our center and those whom uh, we partner with and work with out in the community. Centering community is a critical element of the work that we do. As I mentioned before, for us, it is about ensuring that we um, are intentional about ensuring that community has influence, has decision-making authority, and really can guide the work. And so we use that uh, in practice within our uh, uh, center. And what that means is that the, the Black folks and the people of color within our center are positioned to really help to guide and lead the work, given the lived experience of racism and the different perspective that that provides. Um, one of the ways that we operationalize that is to provide what we call, for instance, centering Blackness experiences. Those are things that we do at each and every steering team meeting we do, at each and every critical allies group meeting we do, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And those are short uh, five to 10 minute experiences where uh, a, a Black person or uh, eventually a person of color um, helps to uh, share the experience related to a particular issue. And so we use videos and, and personal experience to talk about that so that we can ship, chip away at those stereotypes that we're all operating under and not realizing that we are. Our steering team folks have talked about how their equity lens has gotten more fine-tuned because they realized that there were stereotypes that they were operating under and didn't even realize that that was a thing until you don't see what you don't see and you don't know what you don't know. Um, see, uh, Ready Learns, we engage every month with our uh, seat community in professional development related to an issue of race um, at the intersection of some topic area that is of relevance to our mission. Uh, getting ready, I'm gonna skip that and come back to that. We have also designed what we call a team equity inventory and that is a process that serves, initially it served our team, now our steering team is using it and we're also using it with external partners to assist them in interrogating their uh, organizational practices and determining uh, where there are opportunities to improve, identifying priorities in that space, developing strategies, again, back to that translational research practice that we live and breathe, uh, live and breathe every single day. And so relative to community partners, we have the opportunity now are working with the Ohio Head Start Association, who is bringing together, uh, Dr. Hicks is leading this initiative, bringing together nine organizations who will be uh, partnering to look at their individual agencies and use that team equity inventory process to identify something that they can get after to ensure that not only the students 
and the families that are impacted by their work, but the employees, the Black employees and employees of color that are in those spaces and being traumatized by the systems and how they work, uh, attending to those issues and beginning to um, get on the path of ensuring that we are doing so, doing the work in a way uh, that attends to equity every single day. And so quickly want to circle back to our getting ready intervention. Uh, if you look in the topish, I think that's topish um, box, you will see the elements of our getting ready intervention. Uh, we start with self-assessment and really uh, kind of taking individual stock to determine what our issues are, where there are opportunities to improve design and develop an individual development plan that becomes, you know, we use that um, a problem solving process at the organizational level are also using that at the individual level, so to speak, to develop a plan that we can hold ourselves accountable, have engaged in online module work to build our capacity, build our knowledge base, serve as a source for self-reflecting and journaling around that so that we have a better understanding of ourselves. Now, critical allies groups, we believe to be another core and critical component to what we do. Those are in many cases cross-racial, but we don't have an, enough folks to make all of them cross-racial, where we come together and um, based on what we are learning interpersonally, uh, engage in that interpersonal space and really work to understand ourselves and have conversation uh, with each other and think through how we can affect our systems, both within our institution, as well as those that we partner with. And then finally, uh, affinity groups have been a component of our intervention uh, since we started. We started with black and white affinity groups. So our white affinity group uh, serves as the space where our white colleagues can come together and have the hard conversation, acknowledge the hard and uncomfortable truths, and really begin to think about and reflect on uh, what the issues, quote unquote, are, so to speak. Um, at one point, they came to the steering team and said, you know, I'm on board, I feel like I'm learning, I feel like I'm growing, but I don't feel comfortable in meetings addressing these issues. I don't know that I have the confidence that I need uh, to really engage in the work of allyship. And so three of our colleagues, at least one of whom is on the call, um, came together and designed uh, an intervention designed to assist them in what we call operationalizing allyship. So it's one thing to commit to being an ally. It's a whole nother thing to know how to do that, to have the skills and techniques required to be effective at doing that. Uh, and so that is another offering that they provided and have done book studies and other, other pieces like that. Our Black Affinity Group is the space where we come together and acknowledge our experiences, support each other, reflect, restore ourselves. But also those are that is the space where we have conversation about the movement and how it's working and think through where there are opportunities to enhance or to course correct. So we can have some of those conversations together and then bring that back to our steering team who centers us as part of the community uh, to uh, get after kind of expanding based on uh, the equity lenses of some that have a different perspective uh, than those who have historically been majoritized. And then finally, um, we have established a person of color group. Dr. Hicks has taken this on um, and been a co-facilitator of this. Uh, I think in December, we had maybe our third or fourth meeting. Uh, over the last year, we have enhanced the diversity of our center, which has positioned us to do a person of color affinity group and those folks as well. Uh, come together with us to, again, use that space to restore ourselves and also uh, support each other, share around cultures and really begin to understand the different cultures that are, are uh, operating within our center and then also guide and inform the movement. So that in a nutshell, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking fast. We're hoping to be able to have time for discussion. That in a nutshell is uh, our ready movement and the getting ready portion of that movement. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Gabrielle to kind of circle us back to the framework. Yes. 
Um, so this here is basically what Melissa um, talked about, uh, but just kind of outlined again with that social justice pedagogy mindset. Um, so the four levels, intrapersonal, interpersonal, um, institutional, and then societal. Um, so the self-assessment she talked about is where all of us started uh, with the Ready Movement is we took a self-assessment um, that kind of outlined where we are, where we are with our current mindset, where are some gaps in, in what's our room to grow. Um, and then the individual learning plan along was linked along with that. Um, and then professional development as well as another area that that really hits it that that personal experience. Um, so this is grounded in critical social theory. It's grounded in, um, again, that personal reflection, that cognitive dissonance that we talked about, that tension that happens at that level. And then that personal commitment to allyship is really critical there. Um, then with the interpersonal level, that's when we get into dialogue and conversations. And so that's the critical allies groups. Um, the white affinity group actually is another um, one there that has a, a lot of that critical dialogue, that cognitive dissonance happens there, that challenging of um, pre-held beliefs. Um, and really through discourse, learners are encouraged and supported in exploring and challenging um, these assumptions, right? And critiquing systems of power that contribute to domination and oppression. Um, so this method of acquiring new, new knowledge is what literature calls um, emancipatory. And so that's really the focus there. Um, those two components we think is the gold standard and really the critical gem of READY. Um, we've had partners um, or potential partners come to us and really want us to come in um, sometimes at just the institutional level or at just even the, uh, can you speak to us about what this is or give us kind of a quick crash course and then nothing ever comes of that. And we really believe that the intrapersonal and interpersonal are two critical components, um, like Melissa said earlier, that really prepare you to do that institutional and societal work. Um, at the institutional level, we're looking at our internal practices. Um, we're looking at that team equity inventory that we talked about, um, programs, um, and then the steering team also really guides with that and is now taking on some of those uh, institutional level uh, initiatives that we've come up with. Um, again, in that level, um, in accordance with literature, it's that critical dialogue, that emancipatory uh, discourse. Our social justice educators are really important here. I would say they're also important in the interpersonal level, um, but it's really important here um, that some, there are some people in the institution that are committed to this work regardless of wh what the others do, right? There's somebody that's taking on that responsibility to say we're in the position to educate, to lead the discussion, to make sure initiatives that are brought up actually go somewhere. Um, and so that's really critical there. And then that's really that allyship in action. Um, and then societal is with our partnerships and larger spheres of influence. Social justice educators are really important here, the allyship in action, and then um, access and participation as well. Those, um, those concepts we talked about earlier. And briefly, again, I just wanna talk about this accountability and responsibility a little bit more. Um, but just, again, a focus on racial equity is in recognition of really this pervasiveness of whiteness and its global and historical influence on oppression of non-white people. And so if we don't start there with acknowledging the history, acknowledging what the issues are, a lot of this work really can't continue. And honestly, I believe it's why a lot of organizations who maybe try to put together a committee, um, you know, when something big happens um, in our nation or in society, and then the committee is in place maybe for a month or for a couple months and then it dies off. It's not rooted in really some of these, this interpersonal work, this intrapersonal work, and then also that acknowledgement of where these issues really began, how deeply rooted they are and how important it is for us to, to overturn and really assess and critique our practices in order to see some real change. Next slide. So Dr. Hicks, I'm gonna pull the curtain back in front of the <laughs> in front of the participants and suggest yeah. that we go through our strategy slide first. Are you comfortable kind of walking I'm through fine. and then doing the reflection? Yes. Okay. Yep. So um, these are essentially what we want you all to take home. Um, obviously, if we had a couple more hours, we've done all sorts of uh, versions of this ready presentation. And um, like we said, this equity inventory work where we walk um, people, groups, departments through what this means to really start to build in these ready components into the work that you do. But with our time restraint, we hope that these are actually some actual tangible actions that you can do um, really 
soon as you get off this uh, call, maybe in your next staff or team meeting. Um, so engaging in that ongoing continuing education. We really believe a one size or fits all or even a one time gig is not enough for this work. It really requires that continuing and ongoing education. Taking the implicit associations test, um, I'm assuming a lot of us um, have heard of that before and maybe taken it before, but it's always a good check-in as a starting place. It's not the full story. It's not going to tell you everything that you need to know, but it does give you a starting place, again, to expose where are the areas of growth, where are my blind you know, spots, um, and where do I maybe need to join in with someone in that interpersonal connection um, to, to make some changes in myself and in my organization. Uh, regularly reflect on your implicit and explicit biases and how they're showing up. So again, that's connected to the IAT, but just making that not a conversation over here, right? Biases show up in every piece of the work that we do. So it can be a part of every conversation, um, even sometimes with your approach to solving an issue with a partner or organization that you're working with. Your default um, you know, perspective or how the solutions you come up with are likely tainted and biased. Um, and that's why we also couple it with community um, um, incorporating community voice to make sure it's not just our perspective um, and our solution that we think, you know, fits for um, the group. Document the issues that you will address, identify objectives, and develop strategies. Um, as a product of the School Psych program, database decision making is burned into my brain, um, and I'm sure for many of you as well, that we want to have evidence based to what we're doing. We want it to be purposeful. Um, we're not just out here, you know, shooting at the wall. We're saying these are the issues that we uh, see, maybe even selecting one or two, identifying our specific objectives, and then um, specific strategies, and then progress monitoring that over time. Um, it doesn't have to sound formal and scary. It's really just as simple um, as that to have a roadmap. Regularly uh, discuss the role of race and other marginalized identities with colleagues, partners, friends, and family. So that's, again, that interpersonal dialogue. We have to be comfortable having those kind of conversations, starting somewhere, making room for those kind of conversations in our workspaces. Um, that's what we say is really valuable about ready and seat and even seat leadership. Endorsing ready is that we know it's a safe place to have these kind of conversations across the board. Um, interrogate the norms, practices, and policies in your area department. If things have always been a specific way and we've never asked a question about it, um, then maybe it's time to interrogate some of those norms and policies um, and looking for some of the gaps, um, some of the ways that maybe we're not reaching or being equitable to all the groups that we serve. Um, review, to, review data disaggregated by race and other marginalized identities. Um, so we did a book study as the Triple E team, um, I think in the fall or last spring, was it, Melissa? Um, and it was called From Equity Talk to Equ Equity Walk. And it really talked about how um, one of the ways that we kind of get around having to address racial issues um, head on is that we look at data, but we don't look at it disaggregated by race. You know, we'd rather leave that conversation kind of uh, in our minds or to theory and not really have those critical conversations. So when we disaggregate by race, then we have to look and investigate and interrogate why those numbers are what they are um, and actually address the gaps. Um, and then engage with colleagues and partners to develop an action plan and the infrastructure required to actively manage your efforts to promote equity at the institutional level. So again, for me, this is that progress monitoring, make sh making sure that we're not shooting darts at the wall, that this is not random, um, but that we're actually working in partnership and we're tracking what we're doing. We're seeing, is this helping? Is this benefiting? If not, then how can we go back to the drawing table um, and, and try again? Okay, so this is a question. Do we want to open the floor, Melissa? I think we have a little bit of time, maybe okay. 10 minutes or so. And I see that uh, Dave has joined us. So Dave, feel free to jump in if there are questions or dialogue that you're um, positioned to, to help to respond to. I'm assuming people can drop things in the chat. And if you want to unmute and just maybe even just reflect on some of these, these principles we've talked about and how this may impact your work.
So I'll just ask the question, you all are quiet. Uh, does any of this seem feasible for you? Uh, are, there, are there elements that you could imagine potentially incorporating into your practice and your, your role, uh, whatever that may be? Oh, I see. Dr. Dalhide, do you want to jump in? Um, <clears throat> I love this question, um, and and I absolutely love this presentation. It, it's exactly what what I was hoping we would hear. Um, I've been a member of the Diversity, Equity, Equity and Inclusion Committee for a number of years, and and I think that this. Um, process that you've outlined is a really, really helpful way for all of us in Ed Studies, in particular in the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, to begin to think about how do we organize ourselves for action, and, and how do we bring about the interpersonal, intrapersonal, institutional, and then societal um, progress that, that, um, that, that we're hoping for. Um, so, so uh, as I'm thinking about role and work, and I'm thinking about in particular role as co-chair of the committee, how exciting it is to be able to think about this as a, a roadmap forward for the committee and for our department, hopefully. So, um, so thank you. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to, to second that. So I'm Sunny, I'm the Director of Evaluation and Innovation at the Crane Center. And um, I would really love to follow up with you all in um, using this model at the Crane Center and seeing how we could work together and partner um, to, to really um, take steps forward um, in our equity uh, and inclusion work. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate um, this presentation as well and getting, um, I had, Learned a little bit about it from Tracy previously, um, uh, but really just getting the opportunity to take a deeper dive. And then um, I have some more now that I can dive deeper into with what you have presented and, and go look up some stuff and, um, and really um, uh, hope to have some further conversations with you. So thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments? Anna Paula? I I yes, thank you, Felice. Um, I just want to thank uh, Melissa Ross and Gabrielle Hicks and Dave Julian for putting together this uh, presentation and deeply explain the work we're trying to do at SEED every day, every hour, every time we go there. If I could ask one of you to post the link to the implicit association test, I think it might be helpful for people to follow up. I, I think I found it online, but I don't trust my Google search. So that would be helpful. I also encourage everyone to visit the, the CIT website, in particular, the Red Ready Movement Initiative pages. I did post it on the chat too. Again, this is a work that we engage every day. It's not, it's not easy. It has lots of obstacles, but we are proud to we, we are proud of doing this work every day, but we could not do it with the steering, without the steering committee, without Melissa and Gabrielle and Dave's uh, leadership. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Arnold, um, Noel Arnold's uh, work and uh, Ready Movement really um, rely and build on what Edge uh, Office put together. So shout out to Dr. Arnold and her team. And that's, I don't have a question because I'm there in, in the work, <laughs> uh, but I just want to share this comment with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Paula. Before we turn it over to Dr. Stuckey, just want to quickly second that notion relative to the role of Noel Arnold and Edge, also Dr. Nicole Luthi and uh, their generosity with sharing materials and information and concepts with us, as well as uh, resources and support. And so that is a very important foundation to what you heard uh, today. Dr. Stuckey?
Tracy? Yep. Hi, I'm on my phone. <laughs> so I'm not used to being on my phone. And I just wanted to first say that I am thrilled that um, Feet is, has done this presentation. Y'all know I feel like we don't know enough about y'all. <laughs> and so I am thrilled that, um, that your work is being highlighted today. I think it is incredible. The second thing I wanted to say, um, and thank you. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that I want to co-sign. Um, I can't remember the last person, the director of evaluation and innovation, and then Dr. Dollar High. I forgot her name. I'm so sorry. Honey. Um, yes, what both <laughs> of you guys said about um, implementing um, this program, scaling it up. I, I do think that. Um, most of us who are um, in leadership roles or even not in leadership roles, whatever role you're in, um, we want to be effective change agents um, in our settings. Uh, and we, you know, in, at the Center for Technology and Innovation, one of our things that we do is to look at the intersection um, of, in of innovation and the experiences of minoritized and other um, socially oppressed groups, because a lot of times we leave things out. We, you know, we innovate and we say, "Oh, we have, we found a solution," and then <laughs> there's a whole bunch of people that are left out of that solution because we didn't think it through, right? Um, so, doing this kind of work is central to um, making the kind of changes that are more inclusive and that don't have unpleasant side effects for groups that have been socially oppressed um, in our society. So, I am very excited to hear about more about this. And I thank you guys again for taking the time to put together this wonderful presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we're glad you are now part of the SEED community. We can claim you as family now. Dr. Radcliffe? I, um, I also will co-sign and echo all the things that have been said. This was an excellent presentation and I really enjoyed learning a lot more about this program. Um, it also really resonated as I'm part of the steering committee for the um, School Psychology Futures Conference. This would be the third one. Um, and we're tying it around equity and, and diversity and inclusion and racial justice. And so um, a lot of this speaks to the things that we want to kind of establish initially as we get this, the larger school psychology community nationally and internationally thinking about social justice and how to integrate it in their practice, whether that's in the field or in um, graduate preparation or as students come in. So there's a lot of, my wheels are spinning, so I may be reaching out, um, but I, I love the work that you all are doing. Thank you Thank for sharing you. it with us. Thank you. We would welcome uh, you reaching out. And I also want to personally thank you uh, in your department for Dr. Gabriel Hicks. She has been an amazing addition to our community and our work. All right, any other thoughts or? Questions, considerations? All right, well, before we closed, we wanted to um, just give a little bit of attention to uh, the concept of drift. Uh, what we know is that we can have the best intentions, have an outcome in mind, uh, get on the path toward achieving that outcome, and sometimes look up and realize that we are way farther than, from the shore than we thought that we were. Um, and uh, we wanted to just mention that and, and suggest that you all anticipate that and that you engage in activity to actively guard against that. Uh, creating the safe space that we talked about earlier has positioned us to do that because we can uh, feel comfortable or maybe not comfortable, but be willing to work through the discomfort to raise issues uh, related to drift as they emerge and arise and begin to dig into and, and have conversations about those. And so just wanna encourage you to be thoughtful about that. Dr. Hicks talked about this idea of uh, putting checkpoints in place, kind of going back to those plans that you're developing and ensuring that you are checking in relative to your status and course correcting where you need to, again, back to that whole translational research process. And I, I want to mention quickly, and Dave, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. One of the things, Dave and I go way, way back, and he is my work husband. We've known each other and worked together very closely for 20 years. And we've talked a lot about uh, what the role of a white person is in this space. And we've been digging into this concept of centering community and have had a lot of conversation with him saying, the way I was trained 
and the way I operate, I believe I center myself and I center whiteness every single time I open my mouth. So is there a role for me in this work, given that as a fact that we all want to acknowledge? And um, my perspective on that is that uh, we've all been steeped in this and this work takes an all hands on deck kind of approach. And so being aware of that and actively working to mitigate that, it's more about that because this, the, technical, the technical skills that he brings to the table have been invaluable in our work. And the fact that he is white and able to bring that and do his best to decenter himself, accept the feedback when he uh, misses the mark in that regard is critical to the success of this work. So Dave, with that, can I turn it over to you to say anything you wanna say about anything that you heard? Sure, sure. Um, so um, much of the conversation up to this point, I think has captured uh, some of the ideas and really, um, trying to understand how to position oneself as an ally has been part of my my journey. Um, and that whole idea of um, of of centering community voice, in this case, uh, centering black voice has been sort of integral to to thinking about that. So um, I could go on for some time, but some of the key ideas that I've sort of incorporated in my thinking about how to position myself, um, uh, relative to this work really centers on that concept of allyship and what that means. Um, as as M Melissa said, my training and my background is in, in research and um, um, and on the technical side of of um, of um, this work. And the way I've begun to think about it is, you know, I function as a technician in response to or um, and my work is conducted on behalf of the community and critically at the direction of the community. So we've in the in the beginning of this, we were very formal and um, um, you know part of the a, a for, as an example, um, I, I do a lot of facilitation group facilitation and group work. So part of my role in this project has been to serve as a facilitator. But we were, in the beginning we were very very formal. My I I waited for an invitation from a, a community member to employ that skill, and that was sounds somewhat trivial, but it was a demonstration of you know my role as an ally my desire to um, to act in response to as opposed to uh, whatever I might think as a as a white male in, in in this space so we practice a lot of those behaviors so that idea of, of bringing technical skills to the um, to the problem resolution process is is really where my focus has been in this project and then a lot of um, of um, guidance around how to employ those skills relative to um, to uh, the issues that we're trying to address through through Ready. Thanks, Dave. Just wanted to close things out with Dr. Ford's question. No. It looks like you're still muted. Let me see if I can unmute you. I cannot. Do you want to drop it in the chat, maybe? Sorry to hold everyone up. Now, can, yeah, now you can hear me now. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I I truly enjoyed the presentation, like everyone else said, and I'm glad to uh, learn more about what you do, and um, would love to have you come and talk to um some of my classes, especially one on anti-racist, culturally responsive education. Um, I heard something earlier that I want to have clarified. And it was, I thought I heard, I don't remember who, one of you say that you really rely on a lot of your black and other minoritized uh, staff to take on, I see you Gabrielle, <laughs> to take on, you know, to help, anyway, to, to help with everything and so the black tax came to mind mm -hmm. 
and then also um, burnout. Um, so I'll end by saying, help clarify this. When I was in school and we were talking about slavery, I dreaded that first of all. But, but since, I, since I'm black, they expected me to be the damn experts. Well, Donna, what do you think? I'm like, hell, I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> right? So how are you handling um, the, the extra taxes put on um, black and other minoritized uh, staff? Yes. I'm sure you have a response, Melissa. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, that's why I smiled because we, we've we gotten that more than once. Um, and even when I came in and joined um, SEAT and the option was given me to, to me to, um, you know, be a part of this work and help lead this work, that was a conversation that was brought up. So it wasn't something that was, you know, that we have not considered. Um, and I think all of us that bought into it were so passionate about this work that we um, acknowledge that but said that we were taking on that responsibility in this space um, but when we talk about the longevity of the program and recognizing that there may be black colleagues that come after us that may not want to take on that tax um, so maybe you can speak to that Melissa um, but I just wanted to say that's definitely something we we have considered thank you Gabriel I just want to echo that and and Do Dr. Ford thank you for asking the question because we were remiss to not deal with that we had that conversation early on and we decided, uh, Dr. Kenyana Walker, some of you may be familiar with her, was with us uh, when we started. We decided that we were going to take this on. That was a choice that we made. And we were explicit about the fact that that was a choice that we made, but were not obligated to make. Um, because for me, it's important to me that I contribute within my sphere of influence for the world that my son and my grandchildren and my daughters are going to grow up in. Um, but it does get tiring. And there are points where some of us have to tap out while the others kind of step in and take the lead. And there are points when our white colleagues have stepped up. And sometimes like we're sitting back and they are carrying the charge in a way that is beyond at least what I was expecting. It's a real thing that requires attention all along the way. And um, I agree with your point that we should be stepping up and and uh, making the decision to step into that space rather than being expected by anyone, uh, each other, as well as our white colleagues to do so. So thank you for um, clarifying that. And Melissa, I'll just jump in for um, being a co-facilitator of the white um, affinity group that that is um, something that we are very cognizant of and um, have conversations about um, where we we lean on our um, our colleagues of color um, and where we step up and in and, and take that on as as our responsibility and Melissa is always the one there to say well I can do this or let me and it's like no you know we're we're going it's this is our responsibility and we're going to shoulder shoulder this um this effort. So I so appreciate their leadership and guidance with helping all of us understand lived experience, but don't feel like it is their responsibility, if that makes sense. Um, it's my it's my responsibility to um, explore and understand on my own. And then how do I operationalize that within my workspace? Thank you, Beth. I love seeing uh, seeing uh, the, the fruits of the labor. Um, <laughs> so with that, I'm just going to throw this slide up. I apologize that we are over time. Here you will see the QR code to the ready page of our website. I encourage you to check out that page as well as our website more broadly to, to get a sense of what we're up to. You will also see my email address there. We would welcome uh, you reaching out and touching base if there is something that you want to uh, consider with us or talk through with us. So with that, just want to thank you for your time and attention and engagement and um, wish you the best on your journeys. We hope that you will uh, continue to actively engage in, in the pursuit of racial justice.